I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Across the Airwaves, where we read out some of your most interesting, informative, or even controversial comments to bring them to a wider audience. As many of you will know, we were in Normandy in September for our first D-Day recording session. And we published a bunch of bonus content documenting this, and you guys left a bunch of comments underneath all of that. So without further ado, here are some of our favorites. Ready, Sparty? Ready. Under Did D-Day Win World War II, a World War II expert discussion, Pascal Soyer comments. Being French, and as you saw, all the museums, war cemeteries, memorials, bunkers, and so on in Normandy, you can be sure D-Day is really relevant to us. Of course, the turning point of World War II was in 1942, like the battles of Midway, Stalingrad, and al Alamein, and was the end of the beginning, like said Sir Winston Churchill. But never in the history so big, amphibious, and simultaneous airborne operation was made that led to the beginning of the end in Europe. Lived 18 years in Normandy, near Caen. My father was nine years old during Overlord and was moved from Caen to a town between Vire and Saint-Lô, La Ferrière, Harrig, the border between US and Commonwealth armies. So about the Normandy campaign, I have one question. Was it really useful to erase Caen under air bombardments? Well, first of all, I'd note that the size of it has to be put into some context. Like I said in the video, it's an important focal point for us to understand what happened. It's a spectacular focal point. But it wasn't the only huge effort that led to the end of the war. The amphibious landing on Sicily less than a year earlier was bigger than D-Day. The tank battle at Kursk was the biggest armor battle in history and so on. But as for the bombings of Kong, that's a tricky question. I can't answer it to any satisfaction here, but we will address it as we cover the day next year, and in my War Against Humanity episodes leading up to it. The short answer is that it wouldn't have been necessary if another overall strategy would have been chosen, one involving, for instance, sabotage, surgical strikes on the ground, and so on. But that wasn't the strategy chosen, and there were some good reasons for that, which, again, I'll get back to when we do the content. Once aerial bombardment is chosen as the tactical means for interruption and interdiction, it becomes technically unavoidable in 1944. So bombing was simply not precise in any way, shape, or form. And if you wanted to hit the German positions inside Caen, then you would flatten Caen. Simple as that. From a legal perspective, in difference to many of the other bombing events of the war, it puts it closer to white inside of the gray zone of legality that hitting civilians exists inside. Targeting enemy positions inside an urban area is permitted. But you have to minimize civilian deaths and wounded and the destruction of the property as much as you can, which in 1944 is, again, impossible. But like I said, it's very, very complicated and involves ideology and politics on a global level. So stay tuned for the actual content for a more satisfying answer is all I can say. Under Did D-Day Win World War II, a World War II expert discussion, Duke of Lorraine says, I was one week in Normandy last summer. The same day in Bayeux, I visited both the World War II Memorial and Museum and William the Conqueror's Tapestry, almost 900 years apart. Indeed, I think the main difference between Normandy and Verdun is that Normandy was the main cause of France being liberated. Two months later and Paris was free. By the end of the year, almost all of France was restored. Verdun, however, was a year-long static slaughterhouse. Hundreds of thousands of killed for no ground gained. It's a symbol of withstanding enemy attacks, but also of the futility of war. Had this battle not happened, both sides would have had all that manpower to spend somewhere else. Since a few years, Verdun is being repurposed as a symbol of French and German reconciliation. Normandy was one of the most decisive battles in history. Verdun, one of the biggest strategically void slaughters. Another factor I see, the Normandy beaches are beaches, while Verdun is a mainly forested area from a relatively empty part of France. So Normandy naturally had more to do than Verdun, making it natural that Verdun became a huge memorial while in Normandy life carried on. Long comment. Well, um, 
that's not really what Verdun was. And a lot of important developments for eventual success in the war happened at Verdun. But wait, first of all, if that battle had not happened and both sides had all that manpower to spend somewhere else, as you say, then it would have been at the Somme, which is also hundreds of thousands of men killed for no gain. You can describe virtually all the major battles of the war from the end of the race to the sea up to 1918, except if you like the Brusilov offensive, as exactly that. Hundreds of thousands of men killed for no gain. I could talk about Verdun for hours, but it very much contributed to winning the war. That was where the French developed the concept of an air force instead of just planes on various missions. And it really was the length of the battle that allowed that to develop. The French developments in the later stages of the battle were significant. The, the training on a full-scale battlefield replica, the revolution in water transport, and of course the rotation of the French troops in and out of Verdun so that most of the army served there at one point or another, while the Germans just topped off depleted divisions, led to Verdun being a symbol of national unity for the French and a symbol of death and futility for the Germans. And those are serious morale changers. But I think above all, the lessons from the Second Battle of Verdun in 1917, the offensive one, which together with La Malmaison premiered and tested the methods of local battlefield superiority and transport superiority that would win on the Western Front in 1918. That battle took back all the territory the Germans had taken over the 300 days of the battle in 1916 in a week. Those lessons screamed that it was not futile, that it was game-changing and war-winning for the French. And I, I could babble about this for hours, but just, just go watch old Great War episodes. Under Did D-Day Win World War II? A World War II expert discussion. Maje Sotovsky comments. Listening to Spartacus talk about trauma of grandchildren of people who went through Holocaust hits home hard. My grandfather was in Auschwitz, we are not Jewish, and survived. As a small child, I remember looking at his forearm, asking why did he tattoo some weird number on it? All the room went quiet, but I didn't get an honest answer. Many years later, during a history lesson, I realized what it meant. After my grandparents' death, while rummaging through old documents and letters, I got to know about his history, what he suffered during and after the war, and how it affected my entire mother's family. Thank you for sharing that. Now, as I mentioned in the video, one of the many tragedies of the suffering from events like this war, especially the torture, the concentration camps, the enslavement, and the genocides, is that the suffering doesn't end with the immediate victims. It continues to haunt subsequent generations. There's been a lot of research done into how descendants, even those who didn't meet the immediate victims, inherit some of the trauma. I think your experience shows some of the mechanisms behind that. An unanswered question, evidence that something weird happened to a relative that stays in the back of one's mind. Then when the story of suffering is revealed, it puts everything into shockingly personal context. What we think only happens to others suddenly becomes very personal, immediate, and intimate. It threatens us in a very subtle, tangible way, like in, heck, this could happen to me. It's surely not healthy and definitely yet another reason why all of us need to remember that we could have been both the victims and the perpetrators of these events. Uh, Panther Race 1000. Did D-Day win World War II? Most historians will say no and they are most likely correct. Robert Satino did a lecture a long time ago, and in it he proposed that trying to find the turning point or the moment that determined the outcome of the war to be an argument that would not yield any kind of consensus. I really like Robert Satino. He, he writes brilliant books. And I do agree with you. I'm sure there are people out there that say, no, no, this event won or lost the war. And to those I say, which war? Maybe you're thinking of Stalingrad. How did that win the war in China? How did that win the Pacific War or the African War? Because they're all the same war. We did a special episode on the Paulus War Games when Barbarossa began. And the name of it is the German plan to lose the war. Since Jose Paulus, whom we all remember from Stalingrad, pretty much said this is not going to succeed even in an absolute best case scenario after running his war game simulations. So did the Germans lose the war in June 1941 then? Maybe, but that's one country. Did June 1941 cause the Italians to lose? Or the Japanese? And before you answer, I know you can say yes, 
and back it up. And someone else can say no and back it up. It seems to me to be human nature to try to simplify complex things for easier digestion. But the colossal scale of the World War prevents that. As I've said endlessly, history doesn't happen in a vacuum, and the Pacific, European, and African wars are intricately connected to one another. And I will agree with Satino on this one. Under Did D-Day Win World War II, a World War II expert discussion, Bochi42 writes, I think recreational boys for boats and children playing on Omaha Beach is a beautiful example of what all the soldiers were fighting for. I understand how it may seem incongruous at first, that it's not maintained as a hallowed place. If one imagines a veteran looking down on it all, they might have the thought that when we came here, it was a landscape of mines, barbed wires, and the weapons of war. Because of what we did, it's a place of peace and joy for families today. That's a great legacy to leave behind, I think. And it would be comforting to know that their suffering had made such a dramatic change for the better. I used Omaha Beach because it was the one the interviewer used as an example, but this is the view I have of all of the beaches on that day and many other battles. Edit. I wrote that after pausing the video, and I think Spartacus spoke to the point very well. Well, I think you put it very well as well. Thank you. Uh, under D-Day on the Road Vlog Part 2, Ras351 writes, My grandfather landed at Utah Beach. At the time, he was a captain in the 173rd Field Artillery Group. I knew he served in Europe during the war, but never talked about it much when he was alive. After he passed, we found a diary he kept of his tour of duty. He went with his unit from Utah Beach all the way to Salzburg when the Germans surrendered. I read it this summer, and it was pretty intense, the things he described. We, we also have some letters he wrote to my grandmother at the time, and what he wrote to her did not match what was actually happening at the time and place he wrote the letter. He would write back how everything was fine and not to worry that he was far from the fighting. Meanwhile, shells were probably exploding around him when he was writing that letter. Wow, this is interesting. His unit also went into a recently liberated concentration camp. Huh. And that was pretty intense to say the least. No wonder he suffered from likely depression his whole life and refused to talk about his experiences. Out of curiosity, I also looked up some of the villages his unit went through and liberated. The difference between what they look like now and what he describes in his diary cannot be more stark. War zones and rows of buildings reduced to piles of rubble. He describes a young child in shock, standing by the doorway that is all that is left of her house, as well as tank columns, with the burned bodies of German soldiers on the side of the road that remind me of some of the more graphic images out of Ukraine. Now those look like nice little villages with B&Bs, cafes, nice hotels for tourists, etc. It makes me wonder if the people now visiting those lovely little French towns have any idea of the hellscape they were in 1944. His diary also gave me the idea to do a tour of that part of Europe myself where we follow in his footsteps and visit the places he went following his diary. War is truly awful. Sure is, Raz. Um, that's why this channel exists. Very interesting comment and, and also very true. You cannot picture a war zone either post-destruction or worse during a battle. You can't, you can't picture it just right, you know? Well, thanks for that. Under Did D-Day Win World War II, a World War II expert discussion, P. Mouse writes, I think the second question really points out the major cultural difference between countries in Europe who were occupied at that time versus other countries like the US, Commonwealth at that time, etc. This can even be seen in how very different countries remember and commemorate these events. Sadly, there aren't many people to hear stories from anymore. But if you would have asked my grandmother, she would have responded the same way. When those countries were occupied back in the day, people would still go to beaches and at least try to enjoy the sun and water for a brief moment. So from that perspective, it makes 100% sense to the people who live there that things are just the way they are. And speaking from my grandmother's point of view, she would have rather wiped everything away, remove every trace from that period, everything except making all the things look very heavy, historical, and such. She wasn't even a fan of museums. For her, it was nothing more than just ripping open old wounds again. 
seen what horrible time these people had to go through, you can't blame them for that. We are here from a much more objective point of view, looking at the whole situation, something that is often overlooked. Indeed, you definitely can't blame them. On the other hand, we have both a collective responsibility to remembrance, and even the people who went through these things have need for healing. Ignoring what happened, hiding the pain only works for so long. At some point, anyone who has faced trauma needs to talk, to process, in order to move on. In that process, we have to be respectful of that pace, the individual ability of those who suffered, and yet we can't let their suffering be forgotten. Otherwise, we might just be opening Pandora's box and creating the basis for it all to happen again. It's a balancing act that isn't easy, but has to be walked. On D-Day on the Road vlog part two, Mark Jones writes, Spartacus, are you wearing your pajamas on camera? <laughs> no, I'm not. But here's a funny story about wearing pajamas in public. Many of you might know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where Arthur Dent is suddenly whisked away on an interstellar journey through the universe wearing, well, his pajamas. When we were kids, me and my little brother, Andreas, were huge fans. We listened to the radio plays, the audiobooks, and read all of the books. We lived in the middle of Paris at the time, and my then 13-year-old brother decided that it was a good idea to go to school in pajamas, a tart morning robe, and carrying a towel. I have no idea how he got away with it, but somehow he managed to keep that up for several days, sneaking out without my mother seeing him and without getting suspended from our otherwise fairly strict private school. He was a special kid, and he's now a special kind of grown-up. He's a school teacher for high intellect, special needs kids in New York. Go figure. Okay, that is it for Across the Airways for today. If you would like to ask us a question, do not ask it in the comments here. Write to um, community.timeghost.tv and we will check it out there. If you want to make sure your question gets answered, has priority and all that, then you can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv.tv or patreon.com. See you next time.